Thank you guys so much, Jen. Appreciate it. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Mother's Day. For you men who forgot, let me say it one more time. Happy Mother's Day. You can get two cards for a dollar at the dollar store. If you're really cheap. Costco has them on flowers on sale for 19 if you're really cheap. Uh, in 45 years of ministry, uh, Mother's Day has somewhat shaped. It was uh, in simpler then. You just had all the moms stand up, you give them flowers. Uh, but now more than ever, you have women that want to be moms and can't be, and there's a lot of sadness in that. You have moms who have wayward children and there's a lot of sadness in that. You have moms who have lost children, and there's a lot of sadness in that. And, and so there's this mixedness. But in light of all of those feelings, I would like all the mothers in the auditorium to stand so we can pray for you. If you're a mother or want to be a mother and are not yet, please stand. Men, let's give them a round of applause. <clears throat> Don't sit down, stand up. <laughs> let me, let us pray for you, okay? Father, we thank you for these uh, women who have uh, devoted their life to motherhood. We thank you that they have sacrificed. They've been gracious. They've been up all night. They have um, taken care of um, our children. They have been sleepless. They have prayed deeply. We pray this morning a blessing on them. May they deep within their souls know how precious they are in your sight. And for any woman who's standing who wants to be a mother and has not been able to, we pray for that blessing in their life. Um, and so we hold these women, these mothers up and thank you for them. And we pray these things in Jesus Christ's name, amen. Thank you, women. Uh, an announcement <clears throat> that comes with much sadness. Tom Saban, the f pastor who founded Table Rock, uh, passed away this week. He is with Jesus, I guarantee you. He's already received the crown that is given to faithful pastors. And uh, I have called the church, and they know that Table Rock will do anything we can for both the family and um, for the church as a whole, and they know that. So we've expressed that, and we will continue to express that. But let's, over the coming week, let's, uh, and weeks, hold up both uh, Grace Point. I know they feel a crisis of sorts. Uh, let's hold up the family. I know they're in deep sorrow. So you, you make that commitment so my words are true to them. If you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Thessalonians. We're getting near the end. We're going to make it, I think. <clears throat> Here's the good news, Mom. This passage, and, and uh, you know, we're just going through, but lands on Mother's Day, and I, I felt that if there's any passage that reflects really who moms are and need to be, this is it. So if you're a mother, you get to sleep for the next half hour, all right? A well-deserved nap. You, you don't even need to hear what I'm about to teach. 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 5, the second half of verse 14, down where it says this, be patient with them all. See, no, see that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Let me read that again. 
Paul makes a shift here. I, I need to note in those first 11 verses, he talked about how we are to live in the last days, in the darkness, in the uh, sensuality, in the drunkenness of life, how we are to be light and sober. Then he, then he talks about how we are to live under overseers in a fellowship. And then he talks about how we are to live with each other. We looked at that last week, those three commands. And then he shifts one more time to how we are to live in the world. And so he says, be patient with all of them. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. So our three teachings in your bulletin are those three commands. Be patient be forgiving, and be good. So let's, let's explore that. Paul says at the end of 14, be patient. And that word patient in the Greek has the understanding of your willingness to wait. It's forbearing. It's long-fused. It's long-suffering. It's slow to anger. It's forbearance. And so Paul says, when you relate to the world and to each other and to your families and to the church, I want you to be people who are known for your patience, which is a hard thing to come by. Uh, at least for me it is. A, a, a man had to stop at the grocery store on his way home to pick up some groceries. And he was walking down one of the aisles. He passed a man with a boy, and the boy was uh, saying over and over again, I want candy, 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 I want candy. And the father said, now, Billy, it won't take long. The man continued looking around the grocery store, it intersected the man with the boy a second time on another aisle. This time the boy is screaming, I want cereal! I want cereal! And it kept going up more and more octaves. And the father was quiet and cool and a low voice said, Billy, settle down. We're almost out of here. At the counter, the boy continued to scream and kick the counter and the father said, Billy, we'll be in the car in just a minute and then everything will be okay. And this man who had been watching this father and his son was amazed by his patience. And out in the parking lot, he went over to the man who was putting the groceries in the car. And the, and the man even at his car was, was saying, Billy, we're done. It's going to be okay. And the man said to him, I'm amazed by your patience with your little boy, Billy. And the man looked at him and said, no, you got it wrong. That's Danny. I'm Billy. <laughs> you got to go back through that thing to understand how it all plays out. I've said in many, well, two churches that I've pastored, when the new pastor came in, I always gave him a note, and the note said this, people change ever so slowly, which is why we need to have patience. Uh, this word patient is a picture of a man walking into the wind, into the rain, but he continues on. It's that, it's that endurance, it's that patience that he has. Now, here's a good question for us. What is the source of patience? If we are to be patient, what, what is our resource? So let me give you two. We could have a whole sermon teaching on that. There are two I want to give you. One is the Holy Spirit himself. Galatians 5.22 says this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. So scripture comes along and says, as we allow the Holy Spirit to fill more and more of our hearts, he, the Holy Spirit, in our hearts will leak out more and more patience. And to the degree that we don't have patience is the degree that we haven't allowed the Holy Spirit 
to fill more and more of our hearts, whether that's in our relationship with our spouse or our children or our neighbor at work, the fruit, the Holy Spirit's fruit, the byproduct of the Holy Spirit dwelling within us is patience because God is patient. He's patient with you. He's in 2 Peter, long suffering. In other words, long fuse. God deals with you very patiently. And it's only natural that a long suffering God who indwells you would produce that same characteristic in you. But there's a second part of patience, and that's the discipline side, because this is a command for us to be patient. The word disciple, which hopefully we all are, has within it the word discipline. And there is a certain discipline as we are attempting to live the Christian life to practice patience. Now, let me tell you, I'm not an easy guy to live with. And my wife will tell you on many occasions, she will look at me and she'll do this when she gets fed up with me. And that means I have a lot to say to you, buddy, but I'm not going to say it. It won't do us any good. That, that's her expression of patience with me. It's part of the discipline that comes in life. A, a lady rushed up to a famous violinist that was in town about to do a concert, and she said to this person, being a violinist, I would give my life to play as beautiful as you do. And the violin, violinist responded, I did. Greatness comes out of perseverance. Greatness comes out of practice. Greatness comes in all of that. And one of the keys that, we, that, that I need you to understand about this concept of patience is that it's not just the willingness to wait. It's the willingness to have a good attitude as you wait. There are two Bill Muirs in the car waiting for my wife. There is the one who sits there waiting, grumpy, dirty look when she gets in. And then there's the one who sits there with an attitude of goodness, even in the midst of that patience. Ephesians 4, 2 says this, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. So as we engage a lost world and become more and more impatient with a world that seems to be going in the wrong direction, we are to be patient. As we have conversations with people that seem insane in their nature and their perspective and what they're saying, we are to have patience with that characteristic. Paul calls us in the last days to, to be patient. There's a second command here. Starting in verse 15, he says, See that no one repays anyone evil for evil. That word repay in the Greek is payback, retaliation, revenge, vengeance. It, it's this, this thing of, of uh, attacking. It's an assertiveness. It's, it's a payback. It's a, it's a render them. What's evil? Some of your translations say wrong for wrong, bad for bad, meanness, wickedness, get back, retaliate, badness. So, so here's the amazing thing about Scripture to me. Paul, to the church at Thessalonica, says these words, I want you not to repay evil for evil or wrong for wrong. Now, he's not talking about a wrongness of somebody cutting you off and getting angry with them. He's not talking about the wrongness of, of, a, of a neighbor who makes too much noise. He's not talking about the wrongness of somebody walking past you in church and you get mad. He's not even talking about the wrongness of gossip. He's talking about the kind of wrongness that these people have endured, the suffering they went through. So let me, let me Paul is telling to people, do not repay evil for evil to people 
who in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6 said this, And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction. Because they had come to Christ, they were being persecuted. They were being afflicted. They were being jailed. They were being tortured. They were suffering. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14. For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews. Stephen was stoned because of his faith. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 3, that no one be moved by these afflictions. Now, so, so here is the amazing part of that truth. Paul is saying, I don't want you to repay evil for evil or wrongness to wrongness to the very people that are persecuting you, that are throwing you into jail, that, that are doing everything they can to make your life painful. I don't want you to do that. I don't want you to be that. When I was 16 years old, my room was closest to the neighbors, and they had a party most of the night. Still remember it. Couldn't get to sleep. At 6 o'clock the next morning, I woke up to the sound of rocks being thrown into a wheelbarrow. Six o'clock in the morning, rocks being thrown into a, wind, into a wheelbarrow, and I couldn't sleep. And I laid there, and eventually I got up. I can still remember it. I looked out to see who was throwing rocks at six o'clock in the morning in the wheelbarrow, and it was my mother. <laughs> she was getting even. They kept her up till three. She got them up at six. That's wrong for wrong. My gorgeous little mother. I have a friend who wrote a book called I Never Promised You a Disneyland, Surviving This Side of the Magic Kingdom. And the premise is this, God doesn't promise us easy. Um, in fact, he promises hard. He knows that we live in a hard world, um, and he knows our tendency is to frame ourselves always as the victim. When I sit with people in premarital counseling or in counseling, as in, in, a, in a marriage setting, I always find that both parties eventually frame the conflict as they are the victim in it. That, that's our we, we just do that. It's never my fault. I'm always the victim of this. And so that gives me a right when I'm the victim to punish, right? I'm a victim. I get to retaliate. So let me tell you how pastors retaliate. We, we don't yell. We get in trouble in yelling. If I yelled at my wife, my wife would tell you guys, and I'd get in trouble for that. So here's how I get even. Here's my evil wrong for wrong. I go silent. I punish her by being silent. I go to my office and work more than I do when she doesn't do what I think and she's wronged me. I leave in the morning and don't say I love you. I drive off because I know she knows I'm mad. And if she confronts me, I'll say, oh, sweetheart, not at all. I was in a hurry. So I couple the wrongness with a lie. That's 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 who I am. And so what, what, what we're called to do is, is to uh, live above this. Um, wrongness for wrongness. The desire to get even is in our nature. And Paul says to people who are suffering, whose lives are being lost, whose families are being destroyed. Somehow he says, I don't want you to retaliate. Um, we live in a world of uh, 
retaliation, don't we? I mean, most of our movies are all about retaliating. I mean, one of my favorite movies, forgive me, is John Wick series. That guy gets even, man. If you want to tangle with somebody, don't tangle with John Wick. So here's how the authors do it. They create a hero that has been victimized, a good man. They create an antagonist a bad person who does something evil to him, and now John Wick has all the right in the world to go out and kill 68 people in the last 60 minutes of the movie. <laughs> and we celebrate that kind of power. That, and we ought not to. That, that is not who our hero should be. I, I'll, I'll tell you who our hero should be. Our hero should be Jesus. Listen to this. In 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter now, not Paul, in verse 21, Peter says this, For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example. Remember the WWJD, what would Jesus do? Everybody loved it. Put it around your, right here. Put it around there, wear it all the time. What would Jesus do? It's based on this verse, but we tend to stop there. For this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you as an example, leaving you an example that you might follow in his steps. So what are those steps that we are to follow, Peter? Verse 22, he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he continued entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. Our example by Jesus in a world that turned unjustly against him was to turn the cheek, not to respond with an insult, with an insult, but to continue to entrust himself to his heavenly Father. Here is one of the um, hard parts of the Christian life. Do you value your relationship with Jesus more than your need to retaliate? Because Jesus calls us not to be people who retaliate. Jesus said this in Matthew 5, 43 and 44. You have heard that, I, that it is said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Luke 6, 27, Jesus says, but to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. That is the kingdom of God. We are, as a church, to be an outpost of the kingdom of God, and our King Jesus and this kingdom has as its virtue the desire not to retaliate when you have every right imaginable to a spouse, to a child, to a neighbor, to a boss, to a believer. We are to follow in Jesus' steps. Third command this morning, both to a lost world and in a lost world, but in our homes, in our neighborhoods and at works, he says this, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Circle the word good. It, 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 it's, um, it's, a, it's a beautiful word. It, it means that which is noble, that which is excellent, that which is kind. Here's, here's even a better word, that which is is what it ought to be. When we are good, we are, we are gracious to people, we are kind to people, we are beautiful to people, we are noble to people. We, we do good to people. It, it's an incredibly high calling. But, but here's the truth that we can miss. It's this, that Jesus is tells his followers, there's no one good but God. And, and, and the culmination, in many ways, the culmination of all God's virtues, all of his virtues are, are 
consumed in that word good. Take everything about God that's good or all his virtues and the sum total of that. Because all the way through scripture, listen to this, God's description is good. Exodus 34, 6, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness. 1 Chronicles 16, 34, oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, his mercies endure forever. Psalm 25, verse 8, good and upright is the Lord. Psalm 145, 9, the Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. Psalm 34, 8, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Psalm 86, 5, for you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive. Psalm 105, for the Lord is good, his loving kindness is everlasting, and his faithfulness is to all generations. God is good. And you are most like God when you are good. That's the power in this. This is not a throwaway word. And so God calls us to be people who seek the good. But note, note that word seek there. Don't miss it. it. It would be easy to miss, but always seek. Always seek. You know what that word in the Greek implies? I'm going to take you another further. That word has to do with pursue it, strive after it, go after it. Prosecute it is really the word there. Prosecute means that a good DA will do everything he can to get the criminal behind j jail. That, that there's this prosecute, go after, pursue aggressively. And so, so Paul comes along and says, in a world that's bad, I want you to pursue good. I want it to scream out of you. I want you to, to spend all your energy in that. Because you're never more like God than when you're good to your spouse, to your children, to your neighbor, and in the workplace. That's what elevates us to a whole new standard. That's what makes people take note of who we are. That's when Jesus says, I want you to be salt and light in a dark world. Goodness makes you salty, and goodness makes you light. And when you seek the betterness of somebody to their benefit, to their goodness, when you seek and help them become all that they need to be, it is who God is. That's why C.S. Lewis nailed it. He, he understood it in the Chronicles of Narnia and the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe because it goes like this. Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. Mrs. Beaver says to Susan, and Susan says, oh, I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. And then Mr. Beaver says, safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he is good. And it's his goodness that protects us. And it's our goodness that is to protect us from each other's meanness and badness. You have a thousand opportunities every day to be good to somebody. You may not have a thousand opportunities to share Jesus with people, but you have a thousand opportunities to be good to people. We have said here, I have said often, that, that um, that we are to preach Christ always and when necessary use words, that our lives are to leak out goodness. And each of you are in the marketplace of life where I guarantee you somebody every day is watching you. And every day, your authenticity, your transparency, and your goodness is the only, only antidote I know to their skepticism. I met with a guy this week and talked with him. And he complained about life and society and culture and politics. And at the end of the conversation, he said to me, I'm just a plumber. 
he's a believer. And he said, I'm just a plumber. And I said, oh, no, 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 no. You're not just a plumber. Never say I'm just a. You're a missionary dressed up like a plumber. God's called you to be an outpost to people who will never come to Table Rock. And you are to leak out God's goodness to be a redemptive force, because here's the truth, write it down, everybody you meet is fighting some kind of battle. And those who are good to them get noticed by them. A teacher in school, uh, in 10th grade math, the class was very mean to one another, and so one day she handed out a piece of paper and she instructed the class to to write down everybody's name in the class. She put it on the board if they didn't know it. So every student in the class wrote down the names of every student around, looked around, made sure they had it, double checked with the board. And then the instruction is this, I want you to write one good thing about them. And so for the next 20 minutes, students in that class wrote down the one good positive thing about that person. And at the end of the class, she collected all the papers, and that weekend she put each person's name on the top of a piece of paper and all of the things that had been said about them on that piece of paper. Two years later, one of the kids in that class, Mark, was killed in Vietnam, and she went to Mark's funeral. And afterwards, Mark's parents came up to her her and said, we want to show you something. We found this in Mark's billfold. They opened up a yellow piece of paper that had been folded many times, was barely held together with scotch tape. But for every year after that class, Mark had held that paper in his billfold and had opened it up many times many times. We are all looking for somebody good. And you may be the closest to God somebody is going to get, and we ought to live as he lived because he is good. So, let me wrap it all up by making these statements to you. Number one, we are to live revealing God's goodness. You want to know what your mission in life is, your purpose? To reveal God's goodness. Number two, the darker the world becomes, the brighter your light becomes. If there's something good in all of the chaos that is now happening and will continue to happen as the world becomes darker place, here's the good news. You become brighter. And in your brightness, you will reveal to a world that doesn't need God, maybe a God they now need. As society begins to crumble, people begin to question. There's no true north on the compass. They can't find truth. The sand underneath the houses that they built begins to wash out and their homes begin to collapse. You and your goodness and your patience and your forgiveness can entice them and draw them in ways that they never would have needed you or God in a world that was just like Disneyland. Martin Luther King Jr. said it this way, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. And hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. And so Paul, in this passage, teaches us how not only to live with our friends, our spouses, in our neighborhoods at works, he teaches us how to live in a world that's going darker and darker and to reveal who God is in all his beauty and goodness. Table Rock Fellowship is an outpost of the kingdom of God. 
and Jesus is the king of this kingdom. And in this outpost, we will do all that we can to reveal a God who most people have never heard of or have seen, or a Jesus who they've never heard his name spoken unless it's a cuss word. We have the opportunity to be that in these last times. So you want good eschatology? I'll give it to you. Be patient, be forgiving, and be good. So we're going to take communion. You can take the, go to the chairs, the tables, take the elements, go back to your chair, reflect on the teaching, and then we'll partake of them together, the elements. Here's another way to say what goodness is. It is silence when your words would hurt. It is patience when your neighbors curt. It is deafness when a rumor grows. It is thoughtfulness for another's woes. It is promptness when duty calls. It is courage when misfortune falls. Jesus came to do us good by turning the cheek, not returning the insult, to love God enough to obey him in spite of the sufferings of the cross so that we could be forgiven. Take eat in remembrance of him. And the cup, um, for me, it always reminds me that obedience doesn't come cheap. There is suffering in obedience. There is the suffering to suffer long. There is the suffering of not retaliating. It's the suffering of being good when I want to be bad. It is the suffering that comes with obedience to what God calls us to be and do. Take drink in remembrance of Jesus. If you need prayer, there'll be people in the corner to pray. If you need to be baptized, we'll baptize. If you need to talk to somebody about Jesus, Bobby and Steve and the elders and Esther and anybody else will be up here to talk to you. Um, I wish all of you mothers uh, the best Mother's Day imaginable. I can tell you what my 98 and a half year old mother is doing right now. You ready? the one who gave birth to a pastor. She's in Harris Casino at a slot machine. <laughs> True story. True story. Uh, let me pray, all right? <laughs> Father, I thank you um, for the mothers in this room. Some come with deep joy and some come with deep, deep pain minister to them, bless them. May they hear in their hearts that they were wonderful mothers. Made mistakes here and there, but they were wonderful mothers. They demonstrated incredible patience in ways that nobody had ever seen. They demonstrated not the desire to retaliate, but to continue to give. They demonstrated goodness in wanting for their children all that was good. We pray for those who want to be moms. Uh, we pray that you would allow them to be moms. And so may this be a rich and wonderful day for our mothers. May they sense your blessing. May they see it as a wonderful calling. We pray that these words that you've spoken to us will take 
deep um, attachment to our hearts and that we would behave differently because we've gathered here and studied your word. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus, who is the good shepherd. Amen. Have a great day. Say hi to each other on the way out. Moms, enjoy your afternoon.